Hello again. Today we're going to be talking about circular polarized omnidirectional satellite communications antennas. Specifically, we're going to be talking about egg beater antennas. On the bench with me today, I have two different types of egg beater antennas. On the left is a home built egg beater V2 antenna, and on the right is a commercially built M2 antenna systems egg beater antenna. These antennas have different radiation patterns and use cases, different manufacturing techniques, and they have different specific implementations of one of the core parts of their design, the phasing and matching harness. I want to talk today about the specifics of all three of these differences. So without further ado, let's take a look at the home-built Eggbeater V2 antenna. This Eggbeater V2 antenna has the rectangular loops that are designed to optimize the radiation pattern for low elevation satellite passes. In addition to having loops that optimize the radiation pattern at low elevations, it can be used in conjunction with a reflector. This reflector would be spaced not very close to the feed point, but instead quite a distance away. And it doesn't reflect the radio signals upward, but instead pulls them down more towards the horizon. The consequence of this radiation pattern is a gain at low elevations, but deep sporadic nulls towards the upper end of the radiation pattern, which can result in very poor performance for high elevation satellite passes. In contrast to the Eggbeater V2 antenna, the Eggbeater antenna by M2 Antenna Systems here is more of an actual Eggbeater shape, an oval leaning towards a circular loop shape. This forms a radiation pattern that is much more omnidirectional, a nice clean bubble in all directions. But this antenna is often used in conjunction with a reflector except that this reflector serves the opposite purpose of the reflector used in the Eggbeater V2 antenna. This reflector is placed very close to the feed point, and the result is a clean bubble of radiation pattern without deep sporadic nulls that's focused upwards of 20 degrees. This results in very good performance for high satellite passes above 20 degrees. Taking a look again at the Eggbeater V2 antenna, we'll discuss some of the manufacturing techniques that were used to produce this. This is just using 8 gauge copper wire which was manually bent into the sort of rectangular loop shape. We have a zip tie keeping the two loops together at the top. And then these are soldered to these ring lug connectors here. Not crimped because it's hard to crimp onto solid 8 gauge copper wire and get a good crimp that stays, but the solder doesn't move around so much. These are then secured to quarter inch hardware which is in a PVC end cap. I've also done this where I've used an end-to-end -end PVC coupler, so you can put an additional PVC support in the center of the antenna. But for the 435 MHz antennas, this isn't really necessary. On the inside, we see some phasing harness construction here, and we're just using a piece of coax, and that's also secured with ring lugs. More on that to come in just a second. But first, an aside, I don't recommend using the ring lugs and the solder method to build the loops. Instead, I recommend that you shell out some money about two dollars a piece for these copper grounding lugs. These guys have a little set screw that you can adjust how far down this plate is which holds wires in using friction. This allows you to quickly remove wires and trim them to tune the loops and then reinsert them without having to solder them back. Back to the egg beater antenna by M2 Antenna Systems. This antenna looks like it's made of copper wire but this wire is not copper wire. It's uh, steel wire that's copper plated so you get all the benefits of copper conductors because of the skin effect being dominant here at these UHF frequencies and all the strength of steel on the inside so it likes to hold its shape as opposed to getting little bends in it that will pretty much never go away. Additionally they use the idea of having set screws to hold on to the wires. These are a little CNC piece here that has a spot for a Allen key set screw that holds onto the wire that inserts their hole in the side. Now we can also see that they've chosen to support on the inside here with what appears to be a carbon fiber rod the actual loops as opposed to a cruddy zip tie. If we look inside this antenna housing we see four screw holes and these are used to hold a PCB which takes care of the whole phasing harness task. We'll talk about this in a moment but first let's go back and discuss how we implement the phasing harness and matching network in general and for the Eggbeater V2 antenna. A loop antenna that's a full wavelength long typically has an input impedance near 100 ohms. Now in order to match to 50 ohms for two loops that we're going to be driving both loops, we can simply place the loops in parallel with each other and then we effectively get 100 ohms in parallel with 100 ohms which gives us a 50 ohm input resistance. 
but we also need to get the phasing correct so that we create circular polarization. In the case of all of these antennas that I've built, I'm trying to create right-hand circular polarization. So that means that I need a 90 degree phase shift between my two loops and it has to be in the right direction to produce right-hand circular polarization. So in order to get that phase shift, we just use a 90 degree electrically long piece of RG62 coax, which has 93 ohm characteristic impedance. So it means there's minimal transformation of the input impedance of the loops when you reach the other loop to put it in parallel at the feed point so that you get a 50 ohm feed point impedance. And this achieves our phase shift that we need. Now, a side note about how to tell that this is right-hand circular polarization and not left-hand circular polarization. With this antenna, I've disconnected the feed line, but the way you would feed it is center conductor to one side of one loop and shield to the other side of one loop. And then the phasing harness takes care of connecting that to the other loop with the appropriate delay. And I've left the shield connector on here so that I know that the center conductor was where my index finger is and the shield was where my thumb is right here. Here we look at the phasing harness and we follow the center conductor, so the one with the plastic coating on it as opposed to being the actual shield of the wire. And we look for the next instance of the center conductor, which is where my index finger is right now. And then we just apply the right hand rule from the first one to the second one. Curl your hand, which way is your thumb point? Now my thumb is pointing up in the perspective of the antenna's usual operation, which is this PVC end cap is the bottom and the zip tie is the top, and that means that it's right hand circular polarization. We can apply that same concept to check that the M2 antenna system's antenna is also right hand circular polarization, except that we'll be applying it on their PCB. Now for the M2 antenna system's antenna, they had a PCB in there that takes care of the connections to the loops for the phasing harness. And I opened this up and I disconnected that PCB and we have it right here. We can see that it takes a feed point from this piece of coax right here on the white cable and that goes to this corner and then the shield goes to the other corner right here so they're feeding one loop and then there's this blue cable which connects that loop to the other loop in the right direction to give us right hand circular polarization and we'll check that real quick so here we look we see center conductor the first center conductor is the clear cable of this blue cable right here is where my finger is and then we look for the second one, which is right here. So we go from here to here. Now if we take our hand and we curl in that direction, this, this part right here, points upward for the antenna. So when we curl here, we see that that is right-hand circular polarization. Additionally, the feed point of this, we can see they have an end connector on this CNC aluminum piece right here. This goes through some coax. This coax is unlabeled, so it would be very difficult to tell what this is without a uh, trying to measure it and then reverse search for per parameters, that would be next to impossible to find the actual coax, but it's probably something fairly standard in 50 ohms would be my guess. After that, they have a zip tie to keep these ferrite beads on. Three ferrite beads like this is accomplishing the role of a ballon, so we have coax and unbalanced line going to feed our antenna of loops, which is a balanced antenna, so it's good. They got an integrated ballon there, very cool. And then, this blue cable is super weird. At first I thought it was coax, but it's not coax at all. It, it was labeled, and I did write down what the label says, it's probably hard to see, but this is a 124 ohm twin ax CM1PR25 cable. Now what does that word mean, twin ax? Well, it's just like coax, except that it has two conductors that are shielded as opposed to one center conductor and a shield. The advantage of this is that it's a balanced line. So here, we've converted from unbalanced line to balanced line, or at least stopped any power traveling on the shield back from this, so ballon, or close enough. And then we're using a balanced line to achieve our phase delay. Another thing you might notice is that that line is way shorter than this piece of coax that I have for my 90 degree phase shift harness right there on the DIY antenna, which means that the velocity factor on this twin axe is going to have to be pretty low compared to that. Now, for the RG62, the velocity factor is near 0.8, and that results in a cable length that's near 13 to 14 centimeters long to be lambda over 4. I've made this cheat sheet right here that gives us the wavelength of 435 megahertz, what lambda over 4 is for a 90 degree phase shift, and then a chart for velocity factor versus the length of that lambda over 4 line in 
centimeters here. And I went ahead and I bent this piece of wire along the twin axe here, and then I measured that, and I measured 9.2 centimeters. So looking at my handy dandy chart here, we see that the velocity factor of the twin axe has to be like 0.55, somewhere between 0.5 and 0.6 here, which I think is pretty interesting. Twin X has a very low velocity factor compared to common coax. And they've also gone ahead and solved that whole, oh, you're using an unbalanced line to do your phase shift problem. So that's pretty interesting. Another interesting choice is that they chose 124 ohms as the characteristic impedance. Being a company like M2 Antenna Systems and being able to design exactly what you want as opposed to choosing cheap off-the-shelf components, why would they pick 124 ohms? Well, the loop impedance for rounded loops tends to be a bit higher than the rectangular loop input impedance. On the site where this was designed, I'll link that in the description if I can, the person who designed it using NEC claims that he got the input impedance of these loops to be exactly 100 ohms in his simulation. But these rounded loops generally come in at 110, 115, or maybe even a little bit higher. These not being circles and instead being ovals, maybe they are actually way closer to 124 ohms, or maybe it's just what M2 antenna systems had on hand. But either way, they're still achieving the goal of having the characteristic impedance of the cable be close to the input impedance of the loop so there's minimal transformation as you move along this transmission line to be placed in parallel with the other loop. And then you connect to the feed point coax, and in this case, they have the integrated ballon and out to the connector. So this has been an overview of the differences between DIY egg beater antennas, specifically an egg beater V2 antenna, versus a commercially produced M2 antennas egg beater antenna. I hope you found the information in this video useful. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. And if you like this video, maybe hit that thumbs up button or subscribe for more.